and welcome to episode four of The Ed Factor. Ireland, Northern Ireland's only I don't know off. Iron Maiden fan podcast. So that this, we know of. <laughs> this episode that we know of. This episode, um we have to uh start by giving some shout outs. We've had some really, really good traction on the socials and on YouTube. So thanks very much for getting in touch or giving us a wee like or giving us a share. Yeah, thank you so much for your support. It's great hearing from people from all over the place. Um a few shout outs to some of you folk on Twitter that have been following the Ed Factor account. Um, we're going to be talking about killers today. And we put a little tweet out earlier on, just asking about favourite track of this album, etc. So, um, got quite a few responses. From quite a few different places, which yeah. is yeah. awesome. So thanks a million, guys. So really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, we have Randy at RJ Holt 666 from Cincinnati whose favourite track is Murders in the Rue Morgue, although they are all great. True. We also have... Oh, at Mark Ramson 16 from Waterford, so down south, good man. Rothschild or Murders, two absolutely storming tracks. Yep, hard to disagree album. with that, I think. We also have Yannick Bluin. Excuse me, Yannick, if we are pronouncing your name incorrectly. Sounds which good. is Bonjour, mon, mon yeah, frère. Bonjour, which is at Y Bluin. Uh, from Quebec in Canada and Yannick is going for Purgatory or Genghis Khan Ooh, controversial Genghis we'll talk about that later on yep Uncle Steve's Iron Maiden Zone an awesome podcast if you want to get on, get on him on Twitter at Uncle Steve Rock from Texas Killers or Innocent Exile too another, another couple of great choices uh, there great choices yeah uh, we also have David King um, who Maybe from Arsenal in North London, or as an Arsenal fan. Um, There's no accounting for taste, does No it? accounting for taste. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, David. Uh, yeah, uh, which is at D666. And David goes for Purgatory. And finally... And we've got JRJ at JRJ from Ohio, who can't pick one. Which is... A lot of Iron Maiden arms are like that with me. Yep. But I uh, have to for the purposes of this podcast and to let you know which we think is the best track. So thanks a million for getting in touch. So thank you. Yeah, we'll try and do that every uh, at the top of every show. Just a little shout out um, to Just to introduce everyone. us. Yeah. This is Andy. I'm Chris. And uh, we're going to start talking about Killers. But about before killers. we start talking about the album itself, we need to talk a wee tiny bit about their lead up. Yeah, we think it's important in this album to give a little bit of the background, a little bit of the context of how the album was made. And the build up to it so it kind of follows on from the previous pod on the debut album the reason why we want to kind of go into this is the schedule of the band was so hectic in my notes i actually have written and then circled in red tour 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 that so, is all they did yeah. tour 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 it was pretty relentless i mean killers was released on the 2nd of february 1981 and that is just 10 months after the release yeah. Of Iron Maiden, the mm -hmm. debut album. Now, that's a pretty quick turnaround time. So, they've kind of took the foot off the accelerator of late. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> considering, you know, it's been like, you know, six years before that, yeah. it was five years. You know, only times it's only 35 days, so it's as we're recording this yeah, right now. That's great, that's <laughs> great. But, um, yeah, the schedule on that debut album, I think, has an impact on Killers. So, uh, we'll just talk about that kind of briefly. Yeah, we'll not put um, our stall out too early on the opinions, but yeah, I think... No, we'll be coming to that, General definitely. consensus, you may pick up the vibe. Maiden were touring throughout the UK, pretty much from the back end of 1979. Uh, so, the debut album was recorded in January 1980. And from February... Two months before that album was released, they were back out in the road and they did four UK tours that year. So I went onto the, the Maiden website and it's a quick count, so it may not be 100% correct, but I counted 132 shows. In one year? Yeah. In 10 months? In 10 months. My God. Uh, which is a big Crazy. step up from 48 shows in the August to December 79 period. Mm -hmm. So, which is still pretty hectic. Which is still pretty hectic, but 132 shows in, t in 10 months before the release of Killers. Good for honing musicality, good for getting things... Yeah, getting uh, the band really tight. Yeah, 
which is what Maiden to date are renowned for. Yeah. But, you know. They're a live not, band, and that's them honing their craft. Yeah, absolutely. And, and getting it out there to the fans, you know, pre-internet, etc. totally. And look, this is this is what worked for them. But um, where we're probably going with this is, does it have an impact on the quality of the second album? Um, what else did they do in this little period? So they recorded uh, Women in Uniform, which was a cover, cover version, Skyhooks, of a band called Skyhooks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this was suggested by the label. and It's kind of the only time that Steve went against his gut feeling, I think, and he regretted it. Cheesy video. Yeah, it's, I guess, I think the video was pretty good. It, uh, the video was better than the song, in my well, opinion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think, I mean, it's just a live kind of thing, and then a couple of chicks with, yeah. you know, ladies in it. A couple yeah. of ladies. A couple of ladies with, with uh, ladies in the attic. But it kind of captures, you know, Maiden on stage and stuff, but the song just isn't Maiden for me. Um, don't no. know what you think. Well, there's going to be a recurring theme in that, actually. Yeah. You know, in this episode. It's not me and the main. I think they, they had some problems with it. They had Tony Platt in who had engineered uh, on ACDC albums, etc. Yeah. And he was brought in by the label to produce. But um, Steve fired him. Uh, because says the, the, the label had obviously just told Platt to make a hit. Mm -hmm. um, and Steve hated the production so much he actually remixed this himself. But... Uh, it just doesn't sound no. like, like, like me. Yeah, so no, goodness knows what it sounded like before Steve remixed it. Yeah. If he said it sounded poppier and and worse. So anyway, Women in Uniform is also the last official maiden appearance of guitarist Dennis, Dennis Stratton. Stratton. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he left the band or was asked to leave on the 1st of November 1980. And if you've watched the early days early documentary... documentary. It's pretty clear why yeah. musical differences i think is probably the biggest um yeah the biggest reason uh stratton was obviously more into the monolithic side of music big fan of the eagles mm -hmm. uh steve i think said that he was a bit worried that sort of his ideas are more like 10cc rod smallwood i think berated him as well for listening to the e for listening to the eagles george you benson know, and george this kind benson of stuff yeah which and, and, uh, if you haven't listened to george benson it's about as far away from maiden as you can yeah you know get but i think reading between not the lines, that he's bad he's very talented artist george benson don't get me wrong yeah he's a guitar yeah. player you know but to bring that into maiden songwriting no, no. i think it is different i mean steve's in the probably likes well you if know, you a look lot at, of proggy stuff and all yeah that. we talked about that before actually his, his influences are very mm -hmm. varied but yeah uh -huh. not and not at all what maiden were about no no. Which is uh, sad because the, the guy did play some amazing work. Amazing. His guitar playing in the first album was really good. fantastic. You know, can't yeah, look good. He was the, he had the right sort of stage presence uh, and that. Uh, absolutely. But. I think, looking at the run, Mick Wall's Run to the Hills biography, I think if you read between the lines and look at both, um, both parties' version of events, I think it seems quite clear that the age difference it's also Dennis Stratton was a bit older mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think that probably has as much to play Absolutely. It, it just wasn't personality wise yeah. probably the right the right fit mm -hmm. um, you know the guy had a kid at the time he needed a bit more money and a bit more experience he'd been a bit further down the track yeah. and understandably mm -hmm. he probably felt he knew a wee bit more uh, but anyway that was him him gone and Adrian Smith uh, hired immediately what a player what a guy to bring in. A, a, a hero of ours. Yeah. Uh, he had kind of been playing guitar, because he kind of learned to play guitar with uh, Dave Murray yeah, from Dave, the age he, of 15. Dave Murray sold him his first guitar. Yep, for fiver. Yep, and he, I think he made money on it, apparently. Uh, yeah, that's not what he says. <laughs> he sold it on, but they were in yeah. bands together. I think, what is it that uh, Smiley says, a uh, quote where they were in bands when they were kids playing for a can of Coke and a Mars bar type of thing. Yeah, just, just to interject <laughs> there, we refer to Dave Murray as Smiley. Oh, okay, sorry. Because he's always smiling. He's always smiling. Yeah. And we've all always called him that. <laughs> so uh, just to just to put that out there. Um, Hi, Dave. <laughs> well, it's because we love you, Dave. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. Yeah. Um, so Adrian Smith does his first gig on a West German TV show called Rock Pop in Concert uh, in Munich, on the 9th of November, so a week and a half after 
no Dennis pressure. Stratton is immediately asked to, uh, to to leave, and they do run and free. And remember, remember tomorrow. Though, think if you look at the footage that you can look that up on YouTube. I, I'm pretty sure they're miming. First proper gig though was in the twenty first of November, nineteen eighty, in Oxbridge. So just to interject again, a couple of weeks. Yeah, mm -hmm. just to interject again. Have you heard of the? Maybe it's an urban myth, I don't know, mm -hmm. that Phil Collins, not Phil Collins, who was a no, Phil different Collins kettle of fish. Of Def Leppard fame. fame. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Phil Collins was rumoured to be considered for the second, Yeah, you know, the second guitar slot. Again, a very, very, very talented guitar player, fantastic guitar player. I have heard that. Love I, Def Leppard as well, but. Yeah, I also heard that Def Leppard at one point were thinking of approaching Smith. So, Jeez, oh. you know, I suppose it's rock family it trees. Yeah. So it'll be like a rock family bush. So it's it's <laughs> <laughs> it's as well it worked out the way it did. I think both yeah. guitarists. Well, Smith Smith did have an opportunity to join like seventy nine, but wanted to see how things would go with his band Urchin. Urchin, yeah. And then obviously things didn't go too well, and he got the call. And to, to all of our uh, <laughs> great luck, great great luck, yeah. He, uh, he accepted the second time. I give you love at, him. Yeah, if you look at the early gigs and, and you listen to him in this album, it just seems that Adrian Smith fitted in. It's just a perfect guitarist. Yeah, uh, the, perfect lead, guitarist. the lead work is the lead work is amazing. And it's yeah. just and it's the keystone for moving forward. Yeah, and yeah. it, it complements the per perfectly. So anyway, I think you can see there that's a really heavy schedule. Things yeah. are moving really quickly. Um, they're on the road a lot. They've changed guitarist. There's a lot going on. Debut album number up. four in the UK charts, wasn't it as well? Yep. So the better, better pressure. pressure. Yeah. There's and 1980. Sorry, Andy. Mm -hmm. You okay? 1980. Mm -hmm. When you look back at 1980, it was a hell of a year for metal albums as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got the maiden debut album. Other notable ones, obviously, Back in Black, um, Heaven and Hell by Black, Black Sabbath, Sabbath. Yeah. Which is. Bonnie James Dio. Yeah, it was West his Sabbath. first brilliant yeah. album. Absolutely phenomenal mm -hmm. album. What about you know? Judas Priest in that yeah. year? Mm -hmm. did, what album did they have? I can't right? remember. Is it British Day, I think? It could I think. be. You guys, you can probably tell us that. Yeah, yeah I've seen your moment, head, sorry. But, but uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of, you know, I see the year that no album came through mm -hmm. into the... But the established acts are still well, putting Zappen, out... Well, Zappelin are finished in 1980. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But I mean, the yeah. Sabbaths, yeah, the, uh -huh. the, yeah, it's etc. Are putting out yeah. good work. Oh, yeah, really? yeah, classic. Yeah, classic metal albums. Uh, metal yeah. albums there. So there is there is pressure and not much time for writing. Yeah. So I, I think much of the material, in fact, all of the material that yeah. would come off Killers has already been written. Yeah. Um, some of them quite some time ago. Yeah, which we'll written, get into written from be you know before, before the first Iron album Maiden. before Iron Maiden reformed. Uh, yeah. Looking at some of the tracks. Um and some would argue, you know, that apart from maybe Wrathchild, the the choice cuts from this era are all on the first album. Now yeah. not everyone may agree with that, but uh, if you don't uh, please uh, leave a comment, but yeah, feel free to we, say we so. We are giving our opinion and, and other opinions are completely yep. acceptable. Uh, totally. And we totally. may uh, have a pain to talk about it if you want. Yeah. <laughs> but uh you know, at, yeah, these these this is a sophomore mm. effort is and there's always the uh, the difficult second album. Difficult second album thing. I think it's yeah. a difficult second album. I think album it possibly is as well. So let's have a look at the album in, yep. a, in a bit more detail, the album itself. So a few little facts about the album. They released on the 2nd of February, 1981. It is the shortest Iron Maiden album at 38, 38 minutes. minutes, something, 18 seconds or something like that. Uh, more notably, it is the only Maiden album of the 1980s to have 10 songs right. on it. So not only is it the shortest album, it is the only, you know, it has it has more songs yeah. than the rest of mm -hmm. the albums and in the 80s. Two instrumentals. It's the only album with two instrumentals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is no epic. By what we define as epic, for anybody that's just watching this as the first podcast mm -hmm. that we have... Um, Songs longer than say seven minutes. Yeah, you know, different time changes, different themes. Mm -hmm. You know, tell a story. Yeah, paint the picture. Yeah. So we we 
we for the first album phantom of the opera yeah. is mm -hmm. the undisputed epic yeah. track mm -hmm. but killers doesn't have one the longest song in killers is prodigal son which is just over six minutes and i wouldn't describe that as an <laughs> epic iron maiden song no no no, no. So the <laughs> only other iron maiden's album not to have a song that's over seven minutes long is no prayer for the dying no prayer right, for the yeah. dying mm -hmm. which ends with mother, mother russia. russia which is still has a bit of an epic feel yeah. i mm -hmm. think too yeah. it's just a bit shorter and so well you know it's like uh, chalk and cheese isn't it yeah some crack and cheese in it yeah 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 so december 1980 made and enter battery studios in london to record killers with the producer martin birch a legend absolute legend. legend so do you want to say a wee bit about martin yeah. birch so martin birch is responsible for probably uh producing some of the albums which directly influenced maiden yes they would have loved to have had him as their producer on the debut album but mm -hmm. felt and again he says this in the early years doc that he they felt that they were sure that weren't good enough and yeah. they felt that he, he was too may, famous yeah he was too famous and he may have sort of influenced them in a way and they would have been obviously a brand new band young guys maybe too scared to say no mm -hmm. but obviously they got rid of all of their pretense and mm -hmm. hit the ground running some of the things that uh, martin birch had recorded uh rainbow rising machine head deep purple and heaven and hell black sabbath which we mentioned already. yeah he also recorded sorry chris yeah, fleetwood mac peter green's fleetwood mac so some classic tracks like yep. i think oh well and the green, green man, man Alicia, Alicia, yep. which is a really dark tune uh that was all recorded by yeah by the great martin birch so, yeah. yeah yeah so mm -hmm. you know um it is a, a match made in heaven a lot of maidens things are match made in heaven that yeah uh, rod nandy and the um and the you know the management side yeah it's a planet the aligning. band now yeah you and know the, the let's shall we say the musical you know instrumental side of the band now is cemented with smithy joining mm -hmm. um and martin birch who was a producer up until his retirement so yeah and um, you know, much like kevin shirley and i that he you know they keep going back they keep know. going back they're comfortable mm -hmm. working with him but martin he birch is a key player absolutely in, in making maiden what they are and the difference of quality sonically on this album compared to the first oh, album it's, it's it's night and day it really and is mm -hmm. what this album definitely delivers is that first template of this is what maiden sounds Absolutely. like mm -hmm. uh, you know uh and he's he's instrumental in that um so they've entered the studio in december now interestingly they play a couple of nights in the marquee in london mm -hmm. whilst they're recording killers massive club massively famous yep. club 19th. hendrix the who yeah yep 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 it's just off Oxford Street, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's probably so. away. It's probably, uh, probably flats now or something. Yeah, nineteenth but... and twentieth of December, and then they finish. They on the twenty first of December they play a third show, which is the Rainbow. Oh yeah, and this is videoed and released later as live at the Rainbow. They released that in May that year, so I think it's really, really, really it, cool. Just that it captures the band whilst they're actually in the studio making yep. killers. Well, you can nearly say that there's a bit of songwriting happening on stage. Yeah, there is songwriting <laughs> happening on stage. If so, you know that story, which we'll be chatting about in a wee minute. Yeah, I yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, what Chris referring to. So, so the Ides of March is, is a tune that's on live at the Rainbow. And it is there because it was written, I think way back actually yeah. um it's something to do with thunderstick the drummer, drummer from, the, from the early years yeah and yeah the drummer is samson and samson actually have pretty much the same track as well it's called thunder something thunder something else yeah um but what chris is referring to is there's version of killers yep live on live at the rainbow mm -hmm. but the lyrics are different yep i think uh diano says in the when he's been interviewed that uh he was uh he thought not another bloody instrumental and he went out and he sort of wrote them in five minutes before they went on the stage mm -hmm. the melody is <laughs> just the same. winging it just winging it yeah melody's the same exactly uh, the same actually alchemy it's alchemy because you know it's a, it's a great song it's a great song yeah. 
So obviously it also for me gives a little bit of an insight into how Steve was maybe writing at that time or how Maiden were writing at mm -hmm. that time. They had that song, all lead breaks, everything. The whole structure of that song yeah. is exactly the same. Yeah. And that's what it was going to be like as an instrumental. Mental. Yeah. Yet, uh -huh. Diano, you know, gets a vocal line, mm -hmm. comes up with lyrics just before going on on stage and, and rocks it now. Whether Flying whether, by the seat of his satin I, black pants. Now, whether he's telling the truth or not well, about uh, that, I don't know. Would only the, take only, a man at face value. Only the other band members would go, not that we would insinuate, Paul, if you're watching, you would tell a porky. <laughs> but... Um, it sounded great, uh, uh, and I think it's a real cool document of, of the band. As a that, document as time. well though, as Andy, mm -hmm. can you think or can anybody think of a band that produced, this is 1981, mm -hmm. a VHS, a video that you could buy? Um, no, you it know, was... It's marketing again, it's seeing some uh, a gap in the market. A market that's going to be massive in the future. It's quite forward thinking and making the decision to do something about it. And yeah. it is, it is really like, you know, how many maiden DVDs do we have, or CDs, you know, or, yeah. or sorry, or videos before that, you know, it really is the beginning of that. MTV sure hadn't even started in eighty two. It started in America, mm -hmm. you know. So you know that type of thing hadn't really taken off. Obviously, you have recording of you've like Queen. Live at Hyde Park, you've got recorded for posterity, and you know, uh, Led Zeppelin song remains the same. But you know, this is a, a, a wide release for, a, for yeah. a market that exists, you know what I mean? And for these a band, are ladder, these are releases were laterally, you know, yeah, only done one and are recording and it, actually in the studio, yeah, recording their second album. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty gutsy thing to be planning, yeah, a live video and recording that. To come out after the so it also shows yeah. i think the management the forward thinking and the right? people had we're going to put this Adam album Steve. out yeah. yeah we're going to have this album out then we're going to be on the road then to rejuvenate the tour while they're still out in the road in may we're going to have you know life of the rainbow come mm -hmm. out yeah. you know it's it's it shows you that planning smart, you, know? you know smart smart thinking so um yeah the other point i think sorry about life of the rainbow just is it shows just how brilliantly uh, Adrian Smith fits in. I mean, yeah. You watch him and, and Dave and, and just the, listen to them as a band. Yeah. The guy's only been in the band for, for a month and a half. Yeah. And it, it sounds like he's been playing yeah, with forever. them for years. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, that's, I think that's the most oh, stunning thing uh, about it. And and they just look, it just looks right. It feels right and sounds, they sound great. So definitely check out Life at the Rainbow if you haven't watched it. So um, we will now move on to the tracks. review and the tracks of Killers. Yep. Okay, so, track uh, one. yeah, track listing we'll go through is side one. Track, track one, one is the Eyes, Eyes of, of March, March instrumental at yep. one minute 48. Track two. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yep. We so, spoke about that already, you know. Yep. Um, um, and track two, Rothschild. Rothschild. Yep. 19, written in 1973. Mm -hmm. Will we will we talk a little bit about each track just as we go along? Yeah, I think yeah. That's a good idea. So you you, Ides of March is a great intro. Builds yeah. builds up. Also, Ides of March is Shakespeare. Mm, yeah, it's, beware of the Ides of March. It's in uh, Julius Caesar. It's Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's about clicking my fingers there because the, he just remembered the assassination of, of uh, Julius, Julius Caesar. Caesar. So uh, so it's to do with murder and, and, and yep. the plotting and planning. Of murder. Of murdering a live audience. Of murder. So, <laughs> murder, killers, is a recurring theme throughout the album. So, yeah, that's why I was going moment. with that one. Love yep. it. Yep. Track number tr two is Rothschild. Yep. The classic. Brilliant song. One of only a three songs in Iron Maiden's career, which is under three minutes long. Can you name any more? I think I saw that on socials. Yeah, so one of them is The Ides of March. Yeah. Which is on before this. I know, song. I know this. Oh, I can't remember it off the top of my tongue. It's too, it's like, no, it's gone. Well, it is on our Twitter feed. We posted it <laughs> last week, but we'll leave it hanging there. Any of you just want to chirp in, put in the comments or whatever, what 
the other song, aside from Ides of March and Wrathchild, that is under three minutes long, is off Maidens. So, uh, Wrathchild, absolute classic song. Yeah. Um, one of their shortest. I think there's a great interchange of solos here. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, um, in, the, in the introduction. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. I think Smith sounds great. Mm -hmm. um, Dave Murray has a fantastic solo with a yeah. cool hit of the whammy bar yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Um, lyrics, I'd say it's about disaffected youth seeking yeah. revenge. Does that well, sound about right? Yeah, of written in 1973, it's going to be Steve at his mm -hmm. most youthful. Yeah. You know, um, imagine having that sitting in that for seven years. Yeah, you strange know. they sat on that. Strange it didn't end up in the first album, but yeah. maybe it was a case of we'll keep this one. Yeah. And maybe mm -hmm. it's as well that they did. Yeah. Great song. It is a killer on killers. Uh, and an absolute classic that's played live. Yeah. All throughout a few times, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and always works anywhere in the set. Um, next track is Murders in the no, Room. Or someone call a gendarmes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this song got a lot of love on Twitter as well. Yeah, now, it's a, 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 um, yeah, go ahead. You yeah, see, you go. Well, I was going to say the first thing I would say about it is musically, the for me, the, the intro sounds like it could open the album. Yes, absolutely. You know, yeah. so you've had the Ides of March that is great that's yep. an opener. Mm -hmm. Then Rothschild, and then it feels to me like like the album's starting again. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's got this cool kind of eerie build up. Yeah, uh, before Clive Burr's big drum roll and Fort smashes in. Yeah. Um, speaking of Clive Burr, I think this track with Martin Birch's production. Yeah, you really get that punch yeah uh, those cymbal smashes we talked about the swing yeah uh, he it can't be before. underestimated how good Clive Burr was as a yeah. drummer he's not with us anymore you know um but he was incredible listen mm -hmm. to his hi-hat the whole way through yeah it's incredible <laughs> it's incredible it's cymbal incredible. work in general uh, it's very well recorded but on real yeah it's it his hi-hat work there. is awesome and i think is those punches those stabs or smashes yeah. that, that he has really just yeah there's a punch there yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's very 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 fluid aggressive but with feel yeah yeah great great, great drummer and I think this track really probably highlights it more than any other yeah absolutely oh, so. fantastic um, meaning wise so I wasn't actually sure what this song was about I had to look, look it yeah up. well it's pa uh, Paris you know that, the, the vibe you get is the Rue Morgue yeah, thinking, and gendarmes. I also I'm thinking French. Yeah. Did you know before looking this up what no. it was about? No. Didn't so, know. so it's it's based on an Edgar Allan Poe no, novel of the same name, um, and it is lauded as the first ever murder mystery, right. which influenced mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes, Poirot, all those kind of things. Apparently, this was the first of its type, and a lot of the kind of uh, cliches that uh, that are in there a detective with his sidekick mm -hmm. you know and and all this kind of stuff um comes from this novel um, it's a theme though yeah we you know going through yeah novels oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is um this is one of the things that this is one of the first real instances i can't think of the first album, though we didn't really dig into the lyrics too much in no, the first album. No, we didn't, no. Um, but lyrically, Steve goes on to use literature. Yeah. He's obviously does a lot of reading, reading on, yeah. probably on the tour bus. Yep. Um, and this, this is, I think, the first real, possibly the first real example of yeah. him uh, taking a novel that he's written uh, or read and uh, putting it into putting it into a song yeah now, crafting it in the, in, in the music rather than into narrative yeah yeah mm -hmm. very very good now the way it does this is not it doesn't follow the book kind of you know exactly yeah um the book is about murders the perpetrator is actually an escaped orangutan this is in victorian paris i think victorian era paris uh, two women who live in the streets called the Rue Morgue are hideously, brutally murdered. By an orangutan. Uh, it turns out to be by a orangutan. Oh um, you know, their bodies are mutilated. One of them, I think, is shoved up a chimney. And there's indistinct voices heard by, you know, 
people who are nearby and it's the inspector who's put on the case who figures out that actually it couldn't have been a person there's strange hair found and he solves it that it was actually this orangutan a sailor yes. turns up to find a sailor turns up saying oh you know there's a orangutan escaped from the boat we right. docked and all this kind of stuff and um, so yeah. our closest relatives you know yes orangutan. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but obviously extraordinarily powerful uh, yeah i think i think it's supposed to be that the orangutan uh copied its ma was trying to copy its master shaving with a razor and this is something happens goes wrong um anyway as you can probably guess That's smart yeah, That's yeah. Smart. Maiden song doesn't have a orangutan in it. No, there's no, uh, you know. So it doesn't. So Steve kind of shifts the lyrics. They're more about uh, a man who is being falsely ex accused, yeah. and he's getting away. Um, so yeah, there, there, there we go. Um, next track is another life. Another life. Uh, another stomper. Yep. Starts with a cool drum yep. pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, High tempo. High tempo, yeah. twin leads, um, and then I actually find this song a bit directionless and a bit repeaty. I mean, uh, yeah, it repeats the verse, this verse, as I lay here lying yeah. in my bed, sweet voices come into my head. Mm -hmm. it, it, it repeats that like three times, yeah, just with a few wee kind of lead breaks, and it also seems like On track guys you know yeah yeah uh, for me it doesn't come across as a, a as a real classic but um uh, uh, and it's another one sorry we should have said all those first four tracks are all written by harris yeah, in the, fact the all the album? songs are written by harris apart from there's one co-write yeah. which we'll we'll come to and we've already touched on briefly yeah, yeah. um so next track is genghis khan yeah. instrumental and if you have ever been exposed to any new metal specifically papa roach ah yes, 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 yes. there uh, is a sort of second movement in the song which, which is, is a directly definitely lifted taken from, yeah. from papa roach so whenever i first heard that last resort is mm -hmm. papa roach song 20 probably 20 years ago now yeah, yeah. um and i was going that's maiden that is maiden yeah. And then I had to go back through my tapes and, and dig and find <laughs> where that was. I noticed that they've just ripped off Genghis Khan. Ripped off Genghis yeah. Khan. No lyrics, instrumental mm -hmm. track. Um fast. This Ex song is a breakneck really quick. speed. I mean, I um uh, for a while there during lockdown and all I was doing like guitar videos and play guitar and uh I played Genghis Khan. And I thought, yeah, I'll have a go at this. It's a, maybe not a track everyone would expect me to maybe do. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a deep cut. It's a deep cut, you know. I thought, yeah, I'll have a go at that. It's cool. Because um, I think it's a great, I think it's a great instrumental. But um, I was kind of taken aback just by the speed of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is definitely, this is influence in thrash. You know, we said some of the songs yeah. off the first album mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. But the speed of playing here is is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, I, Lars Ulrich did come to, you know, the UK at probably yeah. around this time, didn't he? And yeah, he yeah. Start following bands around, so you know, there's a direct link. Oh, there's a direct link, and uh, I know, um, for me, Dave Mustaine is is probably the most important figure in thrash, and anyone who disagrees with that, James Hetfield didn't play guitar, initially. He was just a singer. Yeah. 
Metallica. Dave, the, the guitar we sign. We don't want to talk about Dave. Dave Mustaine. Comes from, comes Dave, from Dave Megadeth. And, uh, we'll talk about Megadeth some other yeah, day. Yeah, but I'm just saying, he, and Maiden are one of his influences. Yeah. Like he, he openly Clearly. says that. And uh, I think Slash also said that he, in his novel, he said that Killers is yeah. an album that he pl played a lot. Uh -huh. You know? Um, so yeah, it's played a break next week. I love some of the time changes. The ref in, it's a, I, I love this track Drummond's actually. great in this song. Drummond, Drummond's I brilliant. wouldn't be a yeah. great fan of the track to be perfectly honest. Really? With you. No, Brilliant. I'm not a big fan of it. I think it's a, I think it's, um, I think it's a bit, I think it's a bit of a filler. To be okay. Honest with you. Okay. Yeah. We just uh, have to disagree yeah. with that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think it's it's those... very influential. Yeah. But I, it's just, it's, it doesn't really. I'd love to hear some lyrics with it. Well. Yes, I like, suppose. Why is it called Genghis Khan? Well, do you know what I mean? Um, Genghis Khan was the fo founder of the Mongol Empire yeah, in the 13th century. Absolutely. Um, is there kind of nod to war there or empire, murder? Yeah, you think? I, I don't well, know. He it, did murder is, a lot of people. Yeah, it, it is. Is there any particular reason that they just think it would sound cool? I don't know. Yeah. Don't I need that. And I'd no. love to have heard an idea put into lyrics mm -hmm. over it potentially though chris this is i suppose what we're saying at the top i don't think maiden had enough yeah, lot of time to get this album together two instrumentals nearly three on the yeah album. yeah you know for, it's okay get the album we're allowed to disagree so, we're allowed to disagree yeah. We From, don't disagree very often, don't, to be honest. But here, this is what music, is the beauty of music. Yeah, it's good, good to disagree. For me, it's one of the stronger ones off the, off the album, but, um, but fair enough. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. I do I do feel, you know, um, round about that, Mark, you know, coming to the end of the first side, you, you need something to lift you back up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't lift me it back up. It doesn't lift you back up. But anyway, cool. So, moving but, on. Does the next track, Innocent Exile? Yeah, quite like it. I, I love the... Um, it's good. It's uh, Arias is brilliant at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, the, the bit you of bass work. Sing the bass mm -hmm. work. You know, you can nearly could do that yourself. Mm -hmm. It's very intricate at the beginning. The bass work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what do you? How do you feel? How do you feel about it? Well, for me, it's st it starts with a pretty cool bass line yeah. and, a, and a lead lick. But then it goes into this groovy mid tempo kind of riff, which is okay. I like I like groove. You see, and, and yeah. I, I and I, as you know, I do like groove. Yeah. But to me, it's not really Maiden. Uh, it, it's not. It, it do, it's the most Led Zeppelin sounding Iron Maiden. Yeah, track. It, 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 absolutely. It's, it's you're a bit right. Too groovy for yeah. Iron Maiden. For, for you're for right. Because listening back to it, mm -hmm. I do think that there is a the, the riff, the guitar riff. Yeah. Uh, and parts of the drumming are very like Bonham and Page. You know. Yeah. Um, dun, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. You do you know, know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do, I do. But I like that, you know. Diano's vocals, I haven't talked about those yet, and we're not nearly the end of the first side. Yeah. Diano's vocals on this Performance album is good. Yes. It's brilliant. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And double tracked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if you listen to it really closely, mm -hmm. um, excellent. Excellent. Just pushes himself. Yeah. You know, as I said last last episode, the boy can sing. Oh, he can. You know, he can. But you know, he may not have the greatest set of lyrics to be singing. Not his fault. No. But he, he what he does them. with what mm -hmm. he does with them is fantastic. You know, I love his vocal performance in this track. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I, yeah. Uh, I think for me, the vocals, the vocal performance is good. Yeah. Music's a bit too groovy. Uh, I. My problem is it is kind of it's two verses and then an outro, that's it. Yeah. So it kind of feels to me it doesn't really go anywhere. It's just you know, where's the? There's no chorus. There's no big hook. There's no. Yeah. There's no even really big cool instrumental. There's no time change. There's no. It just kind of you know doesn't really there, go anywhere. This is just safe to be. You know, they didn't have enough time. They didn't have it. enough time. We're, you know. Yes, I get it. That would be a great. That would be like a great second section mm -hmm. where Diano comes in with the, the lyric. It'd be a great second section of another song. Yeah, but not a song in, in, in no, that's fair its, enough. its own entity. That's fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we'd discussed this a wee bit more before we started recording. <laughs> no, I like that we, we, we don't actually. Uh, yeah. We have a very, very quick chat before, <laughs> like, you know, a, yeah. minute, a couple of minutes type thing. Uh, but it keeps it fresh. Oh, it does, cool. yeah. um, lyrically, you were saying the, the lyrics there. Um, 
So again, the kind of themes, you know, my life is so empty, nothing to live for. My mind is all confusion because I defied the law. Yeah. So he's done something wrong. Again. Again. <laughs> yeah. He wants to get away from it. Again. His life's empty again. Yeah. There's those themes that are kind of coming back um, throughout the album. You know, they say I killed a woman. They know it isn't true. They're trying to frame me. Oh, because of you, I'm running. You know, all that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah, familiar themes that are revisited in this album. In a very so, groovy way. Yeah. So next track is the title track, Killers. Tur turn it over. Yep. Side two. Side two in the old days. And it is a cracker. And this is an absolute cracker that just fizzes, yep. I think, every time. This is this is great. Yep. This yep. Song. Yeah. I love this song. For me, with Rothschild, which is obviously yep. a bona fide classic. The two. It, it, for me, this is the, the track off the yeah, album. I, I, I agree. I think it's head and shoulders above, with Rothschild, above everything else. Although Murder's in the Room, Morg is, is really strong yeah, as well. Yeah, it's good too. Um, yeah. But for me, the rest of the album isn't near those those three songs, actually. So Killer's brilliant. It's the, the only vocals. The vocals on yeah. this are class. Written really good. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. It's written <laughs> by Diano, the, the lyrics, as we were, were saying. I, I prefer the rewrite that he's done for, yeah, uh, for yeah, the obviously yeah than the yeah. live at the rainbow because he had a bit longer than five minutes he had more in than the green room having yeah, a can yeah. of beer the, <laughs> it's the, the, the they're brilliant i mean their lyrics about a, a murderous stalker um there's great atmosphere in the song yeah a, a, and diano's voice is there's a venom yeah venom uh -huh. yeah um, well, he's ownership over it you know yeah yeah he, he's telling a real cool story here yeah. mm -hmm. uh one of the things that I love about it is that he's kind of he starts off the first verse is a perspective of like a witness yes to this you know mm -hmm. it's uh you know you walk through the subway yeah. his eyes burn a hole in your back mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff you know cool riff uh, yeah. uh, and the cool pitched harmonic yes thing they do at the start to slide up yes which yeah, Billy Corgan zero, and zero from yeah yeah. I was going, he's a half inch that, and he's big man Fanta. Uh, yeah. Just a little parallel, the band way back in the nineties that I used to be in. Yeah. We we did a cover of zero, That's and, right. and I had to, I had to tell those guys. By the way, this is a complete rip off <laughs> of, of Killers, and they didn't know no, what I was talking about. I had to go and play it for them. And go, only Killers is better. It's faster. <laughs> like, that, that's better, better version of the same riff. Um, so Fargo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, gr great. The 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 perspective then changes from the the, the lyrics from from the witness yep, to the perp to, to that of yeah, the perpetrator, yeah. the, the the killer. And there's real venom and his motivations to kill. And it's just, it says there's a lot of verses throughout this album are repeated, as we're saying, because they yeah. probably didn't have time. This is the one song where repeating a verse. For me, really works. It uh, drives the uh, it drives an art of it. Does yeah. It does. They, they repeat. Mm -hmm. They take the first verse, which is uh, from from the kind of witness view. Yeah. And it's also the last verse. And for me, that is kind of it's the cycle of murder starting over again. Yep. Okay. Um, it's the next victim. Serial killers. It's a serial yeah, killer yeah, type yeah, thing. Yeah. That's what it does for me. And I I I, I think Diano's lyrics are. Possibly the best thing, his finest work. Yep. There, sorry, go could on. Be the best thing in the album. Yeah. The the what song? It could be the best thing in the album. I I think it's yeah. probably the best track on the album. Yeah. I very, agree. Very close yeah. with Rothschild. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, murders in the room morgue would then be next. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. weird because we don't usually agree on, uh, uh, on tracks. Uh, on but, tracks, but, but yeah. yeah, I would be. I would agree totally with you there. Um. Yeah. No. I, I know from our Twitter feed that um, there's a lot of love for some other tracks there. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll 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 have to. Uh, obviously, everyone has their own favorites. Okay, and there's yeah, well, no right or wrong. Life. Yeah, you yeah. I mean? There's no right or wrong. You know, you like tea. I like coffee. You know, you like nuts. I like crisps. Yeah. Yep. Or so, potato chips if you're listening to this in America. Or, or if you're listening to this in America. <laughs> potato <quality>. chips. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's Killers. Yeah, so we both Brilliant. think absolute, absolute classic. Um, next song okay. is 
the longest song in the album, which is just over six minutes, is Prodigal Son. Is it an epic? No. No, it's not an epic, no. Um, 1973 I, composition again. This is an older track, I didn't know that. Yep. Right. It's a, it, well, they're all written. Uh, yeah, but, I you know, back, but never played live. Never played live. Probably says something. It does, because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to say something a wee bit odd, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's written with a 12-string guitar. I believe could be wrong. You could be right. Could be right. Could Got be acoustic wrong. guitars Definitely. in it. Yeah, Listen it's acoustic. To writing riff. on the wall. How does it start? Acoustic guitar. Whatever. Yeah, but that's where the similarity would end, that's, and it's a very tenuous yeah. similarity. To be honest with you. Yeah. This is um. This is not maiden. No, I I think it's a bit of a plotter. Yeah. Um. I think they're. For me, you can see a songwriter who's trying something else. I I put a bit of. It's a girlfriend song. Departure in there, a bit of, you know, light and shade, if you want to call it mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But for me, it just kind of plods. There's a couple yeah. of nice bits of guitar work, um, but it doesn't really go anywhere. No. Uh, it's a bit directionless yeah, for me. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not. It's just, it's it's just a, a bit truly meh. memorable. Mm. A bit meh. But I yeah. do know, yeah, for me, yeah. you think the same. I do, uh, agree, yeah. uh -huh. I, I do know that some people love this song. I had a couple of people on Twitter say, saying it was their favourite song off the album. Yeah. So there you go, each to their own. Um, lyrically, it's a song about despair and Is it about being one? disillusioned. Wanting to get away, maybe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, right. yeah. Um, there's a theme, people. There's a theme here. Uh, it Also, it's pleading to Lamia. Which is a child eating monster or a night hunting demon from Greek mythology. Greek mythology. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is also. It, that's 1973 written all over. <laughs> Do you think about it? Yeah, well, maybe, but. Uh, Concept, album, prog, yeah, plotting. Yeah, it is. Mythology. It is. I mean, you, I, yeah. you can definitely see, I suppose, Steve's prog influence there. Yeah. I think what he maybe takes from this is his ability to then mix it with you know, you can have a bit of that yeah but he finds that for it to work in maiden you you, you gotta have you gotta take it up you gotta have yeah, you gotta have the big tempo. courses yeah you gotta have you know a bit of heaviness changes yeah to, you, you mm -hmm. know uh, that's that's where he goes but um yeah absolutely it doesn't happen on this on this track so uh yeah bit of an odd one um i also think it's very repetitive lyrically. Yeah, it is. There's uh -huh. a lot of lot of repetition there. So, which, as we said, we're repeating ourselves, saying it happens a yep. lot on the album. Yep. So then we are on to the ninth track, which is Purgatory. Purgatory. Yeah. No, I, I, I like this song. Quite like it. It was a single. It was a single. Yeah. Uh, it was a single. Um, it. I think has quite a strong chorus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although, live favorite too. A live favorite yeah. too. Mm -hmm. uh, I, however, think uh, quite a lot of people on Twitter said this was a great song. Yeah. They mm -hmm. really, really liked it. I love how the guitar line follows Diano's melody yeah. in mm -hmm. the chorus. Uh, I just wonder if they could have come up with some more something a bit more memorable lyrically. Yeah. For, maybe doesn't quite quite stick. Um, well, you know, it's an awful lot for one man to carry a band. Yeah, uh, and I, I, I think that's a great point, actually, because you know, Steve he, is writing everything. Yeah, I mean, there's is. one co-write from Diano in this. And he did it and he's the singer. when they're doing it live. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a, an awful lot, you know, and um, this is where we see the branching happen. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with what happens in the future talk about at a later time yeah you he needs the cavalry to come yeah he do, yeah I, th I think that's a great way yeah of expressing that i mean he's pretty much writing everything himself here yeah you know um it's interesting as well that diano hasn't chipped in with as many lyrics on this one as you could probably the chip in one. where to find uh you know a paint or a party somewhere you yeah, know yeah well, I think, oh, Paul. I think Paul Diano says he's pretty much out to lunch in this one. Yeah. That's why he, the way he put it. Um, I, I mean, Dave Murray doesn't have a single co-write in this album either. You know, so um, 
it's also it, it, lyrically it's, it's too nice too nice maybe to say listen i've got a at, at this moment in time you know well we don't know but lyrically his song's also about kind of being in limbo yeah um, like this album kind of <laughs> I, I, I like a album kind of yeah uh, and about wanting to escape and stuff but I, I it's one of the it's a good track a, a, a solid track well purgatory is that's what the, it is in the catholic faith it's where you go after you die and you atone for your sins and mm -hmm. you know depending on how bad you are that's where you, where you stay yeah for, for you know for a certain period of time it's 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 limbo in this case 38 minutes <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't go that far no. i wouldn't go that far um so yeah, anything else was ever? No, I am. I'm no. fine. If I, I uh, yeah, it's just. Uh, I think Steve's just getting a bit. Uh, ring rust, not ring rusty. War weary. They're the weak, They're the weaker tracks. Yeah, like mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I thought it's an odd choice for a single. I thought so. Too. Yes, that is a really good mm -hmm. point. Actually, the, so the singles on the album were Twilight Zone, which isn't on the album. Yep. Uh, although it was a double A side with Raft Child. Uh -huh. now, why you wouldn't put Raph Child out as a single on its own? I, I, it seemed odd to me. I think that's a bit of an odd choice. Um, it's and, uh, it's um, and then Purgatory. There's yeah. there's definitely there isn't full control yet. I think. Yeah, record co company maybe interference. I don't know. Whatever. I don't know. You but, know, but, but strange, strange kind of it's single uh, choices yeah. for, for me as well. Yeah. As well, but it's it's a decent it's still song. it's still like I said as well that time. Mm -hmm. Musically, it was like stew, disco, mm -hmm. ska, metal, pop, yeah. novelty records, mm -hmm. you know, the last knockings of classic rock, you know, American influences, new wave. What what was there not happening? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, so a lot going you know, on. there's yeah. a lot of people, yeah. a lot of contenders out there, you know, a lot of a lot of competition for the for the pound for the half p or the yeah the pence you they're know? probably not going to get they know they're not going to get a lot of radio play or yeah. any radio play anyway but anyway purgatory then the final track track which closes the album is drifter drifter yeah. which is straight ahead rocker yeah i'd call it um for me it's not one of the most memorable riffs no um Nice mid tempo section, some clean guitars, I think, uh, and a really, really nice solo in there by Dave Murray. Yeah. Um, and lyrically, it's about a guy wanting to run off and escape with his girl. Oh, escape. Again. Escape again, yeah. The album uh, should have been called Escape. Escape. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It also has, I think, some of the most unmaiden lyrics ever, you know. Yeah. What you feeling when you hold me tight? I want to cuddle up to you tonight. I'm Gonna get you no, feeling no, some no, scared. This is a family podcast. <laughs> It's a family podcast. I, I I think that's very unmaiden, you know. It's a girlfriend song. I said mm -hmm. it before. Prodigal son. It's a girlfriend song. Mm -hmm. You want to listen to our main love? That's okay. No problem. Put uh, Twilight Zone on. Or sorry, I put Prodigal Son on. Yeah, I'm not so sure. Your Drifter's <laughs> just more of a aimless guy wanting to kind of it's like bon Jovi run, lyrics. run away with his girlfriend type it's thing. It's like Bon you know? Jovi lyrics. Mm-hmm. A little bit, I yeah, suppose, yeah. You know, so a, a little bit more of a geezer on the run rather than a, a you yeah, know, a Quaffered, uh, yes, New Jersey yeah, boy. Yeah, it's a bit more edge to it. Geezer, than yeah, yeah. geezer on the run. That's, but, uh, that's the shit I call it. But anyway, Drifter closes the album. Drifter was, uh, I think, though, quite a popular tune live it sounds for, great for quite a long time you know some um, great well murray so sir always he doesn't mind. yeah i mean and they played it on the uh on the early, early days, days too, tour yeah. you know with bruce singing <laughs> yeah. it and, and it sounds all right but um i wouldn't call it classic so um there we go that is that is pretty much the 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 album that's the killers you know um it's um not not the best Iron Maiden album, and uh, I, I'm actually we've talked about it a considerable length here. A considerable length. You know, we have we didn't give an album which we like a lot more collectively. Yeah, is half the time. I think the reason yeah. for that is we've talked about lyrics. Yeah, uh -huh. a wee bit, and we've tried to set the scene yeah. a little bit. And just watching the first podcast, maybe we hadn't done that. Maybe we should have. So this is where we're we're let learning. Us know. Let yeah, us know. let us let us yeah, know. No. We're trying to learn as we go along yeah, to, to kind of make mm -hmm. it a bit more informative and yeah. a, a bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so regarding the album, we're, we'll we'll give you our scores shortly. We're just going to talk a little bit about the Killers tour. Yeah, you go first. I have a I have a, a zinger coming. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So the Killers tour, 
uh, saw the band play a lot more extensively in Europe and visit the United States and Japan for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, the live EP Made in Japan That's was right. recorded during their four date run there uh, on the 23rd of May 1981 and it's released on the 14th of September 1981. Between January and September of 81 they play about 116 gigs. <sighs> Uh, and that's like 250 plus gigs in it's a uh, <laughs> I've, two years. Yeah, it's a lot of gigs. All um, over the world. They're Australia too, aren't they? They're Australia too in this too, I think. I, they do go. I think they do. They go to I, Australia I, well. I think it's the following tour. Do you? I think it's with Bruce that they go to Australia. I think they're, uh -huh. I'm pretty sure their breakout in Australia comes on Number of the Beast. Okay. So, so could be wrong. About that, you, you go to Japan, right. you may as well go to Australia. Um, yeah, but Rod Smallwood and the budget. <laughs> I'm, joking, I'm, joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> this isn't a package yeah. tour, this is, is a rock and roll. Tour, this is a rock and roll. Um, made in Japan that we were talking about there proved to be the last release of the Diano era. The Swan Song yep. of Paul. The Swan Song of Paul. And this is kind of why I wanted to talk about the Killers tour yeah. a, a little bit. Um, so I think Diano quite is open about the fact there's no secret he struggled on the killers tour yeah he wanted to go home did he they cancel the german leg of it because he drank and doing yeah. drugs as they probably a lot of them were but yeah not rars the voice wasn't holding up he didn't want to nights he didn't want to go on yeah. Um just lost the, the, the hunger he just didn't want the hassle yeah. lost the hunger and um, didn't want it his last gig was on the 10th of september 1981 in right. copenhagen Denmark, Denmark. Uh, and it definitely was a kind of a mutual consent thing you know um, Steve Harris had kind of hoped that he kind of pull his socks up type mm -hmm. thing um, give him a, ah. had a few chats with him you know you no, it's not like they kicked him out you no know. They, they, they didn't uh, yeah. it, it was definitely a mutual thing but uh, I, I've really I've lifted a quote here from Steve Harris Go from ahead. Run to the Hills yep Bi um, biography Mick Wall's book uh, well worth it, it if you can get it. I think it uh, kind of sums up mm -hmm. the, the, the thing. So Steve says, or said in the book, about Paul. So he was a bit gutted, but also a bit relieved that he didn't have to put up with the hassle of being on the road and having all these things to do, these responsibilities to shoulder, because it's a really big job being the front man. But I still can't really understand it. <laughs> It was almost like he had a death wish when it came to success. I mean, it's a real, real shame because I always thought of Paul as a really, really ta talented guy. And not just as a singer, but as a songwriter mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I mean... It's the highlight of the album, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. I mean, Steve goes on <clears> to say, <throat> he didn't have tons of stuff, but Remember Tomorrow and the lyrics to both Run and Free and Killers, mm -hmm. it was great stuff. I mean, he had it. And he just sort of threw it away. So I think that shows there's frustration there with Steve. And I think Steve is such a determined character. Driven guy. Driven yeah, guy. Absolutely. That he, even all those years later, decades later, mm -hmm. still can't understand why, you know, someone wouldn't yeah. want to be living the dream or want to be gone. It, you know, Paul's response is just, I had it. But the thing was, I didn't want it. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's his reply. Mm -hmm. People say people still come up to me and say, you know, don't you, you know, don't you wish it was you and all that. And he says, but mate, it was me, and I didn't want it to be. Yeah, do, do not do not get it. You know, you know, and he's, you know, up until I don't know where he's touring or not at the moment, but obviously like he's not touring because of COVID. But you know, he, he he has still so much goodwill and high regard. Amongst the fans. fans, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah you know, in a way, like not like Blaze, different story, but mm -hmm. you know, same way, you know, um, yeah, I think Paul, independent spirit, yes, a free spirit, free spirit, and yeah. probably mm -hmm. didn't that free spirit didn't kind of combine well with the structure and the, the setting of a business and the push of yeah. of, 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 yeah. of you know doing a set making your hobby into your profession yeah probably he just didn't want that mm -hmm. he wanted to keep it as a hobby yeah you know mm -hmm. once it became work like and 
it's very easy for us as fans to sit and say, but like I've done some gigs. I've never done a you know a tour anywhere near my goodness the amount of gigs that they've done. Yeah, I mean. That would kill most of us. That would kill, yeah. You, you, you know, you most of us a, would be wanting to go home. You need home. to have a certain constitution and a certain drive, and you also have to be able to give up. It's not easy. Your like, life, as you know it, until at that stage, yeah. you know, it's um. And delivering night after night, night after night. night, and that's where really he suffered. You know, yeah. maybe he felt he couldn't do it because. But what an interesting thing about the tour, going mm -hmm. going on an aside from the tour, um, Kiss, the influence of Kiss. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not a massive Kiss fan, and if you are. Please, that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But they toured with Kiss, I think, I want to say twice around in this time. Yes, yes, they did. Definitely in Europe. Uh -huh. And I think they toured in America as well. So I'm not too sure. Yeah, they supported them. Yeah, they, uh, mm -hmm. and they supported them, yeah. And this is where we get the marketing, mm -hmm. I think, the drive. Paul Stanley, Absolutely. a great book, if anybody wants to read a rock book, and not really a very popular one, is Paul Stanley's book, which is mm -hmm. brilliant. Mm -hmm. really, I really read good. that. And I'd everybody, love to... everybody knows about Gene Simmons. Mm -hmm. He's well, I, I, well, in the UK, he's done some television shows and stuff like that. Gene Simmons portrays himself as the businessman. Paul Stanley just as much, I would say. Mm -hmm. But I would say there's a model there that Maiden definitely took from now on, took an inspiration from to create this this brand. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I behemoth of a brand. Yeah. I can sanctuary grip the sanctuary grip now, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, <laughs> I can definitely see that because Kiss were pioneers, really, that, you, know, you know, in the seventies. You know, any of those American like bands, you know, lunch boxes, the, lunch boxes toys, toys, figures, uh, everything, TV specials. That yeah. I love to see the image, you know, raising hell, mm -hmm. a maiden TV special. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I mean, yeah, for well, me, and the, that fanatic fan base. The yeah. main difference would be Maiden's music. Oh, that's far, you know, like head and shoulders above. But the brand and all, yeah. I can definitely see yeah. that's a great point. That is, well, it's just something I always think we need to talk a wee tiny bit about. And I mean a wee tiny bit, I don't want to be boring, but, you know, marketing, image. Mm -hmm. It's so important today. Yeah. But yeah. they are Maiden mm -hmm. in this genre. They are the innovators and the pioneers. I think that's a good thing that we can... Video, first video. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Definitely the first iconic Eddie. Being this one. Killers. Original. Mm -hmm. Try getting that on eBay. That's all I'm going to say. Original. He was wearing that when we were flipping. Yeah. School. Seen better days. Yeah. But, it's been but, gigged uh, a few times. Yeah. I've had this t-shirt since. But. I got this t-shirt in the States in 19... 89 or 90 I think actually cool so did so um, and it's Phil Fetzel yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was it drowned me at the time <laughs> good point but uh, um, <laughs> absolute you know I can't you know when you start to look at it and you start to actually really think you're a fan you're involved mm -hmm. you know it's amazing, but this is this is you know that that's iconic. That well, picture belly with the yeah. axe in the hand, it's iconic. On your branding and on the edges. I have a pencil case down down below there, <laughs> you know, with the exact same thing on it. This definitely cements Eddie. It cements the marketing. <clears throat> yeah, it is. I mean, there's a couple of cool Eddies in this. We said Twilight Zone. Yeah. Um, the woman in uniform. Yeah. Eddie's pretty cool as well. It is. Yeah. Um. And Me in Japan. Purgatory is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It's like half devil, half... Yeah, well, again, Eddie. iconic. Eddie. You know. The Twilight Zone is... And brings us to the next... A ghostly Eddie. Yeah. And the reflection the girls mirror. looking into mm -hmm. her mirror or dresser or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty cool Eddie. But this, this is just an absolute yeah, classic. It's, it's probably, I'm sure, is one of their best-selling images. Yeah, I, I it's probably you know, the, the most... You know, recognizable. It's not my favorite, Eddie, but mm -hmm. it's definitely the most recognizable one. It, but the axe. It's definitely one of my you know, favorite Eddies. Yeah. If you're six, but the axe is on the six. There you the go. Axe is on the back there. If you're six, you're sixty. That's going to be something that you're going to think yeah. that's pretty cool. It it is a, cl a classic Eddie, and um, just what you were saying. I suppose we finish off and then give our album rating. Yep. Um, about the influence of Kiss. 
live Kiss put on a really big show. Yep, they did indeed. And I think you're probably, it's a great point you've made there. Stagecraft. On you know. the next tour, I think yeah. you'll see the show gets bigger. Yeah, and we'll talk does. about that, obviously, when we're talking about Number of the Beast. Big things are coming. And that's probably, they've mm -hmm. taken inspiration yeah, absolutely. from yeah. being on the road. Yes, yeah. 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 So we, that's that's something we'll pick up on on the next one. So No, um, no doubt. We will give you our marks for yeah. killers. Uh, the right. Ed, Ed Frank, our individual ratings and then our combined ratings. So, right. Uh, you went first last time. I'm going to go first this time. Yes, go for it. I'm going to give this mm -hmm. five and a half. Five and a half. Five point five. This album leaves me. It does not. It is not on my regular playlist. Shall we say? Okay. It has been mm -hmm. for this. Yeah. Um. But um. It is quite, quite um, full of filler. It's definitely the mm -hmm. dictionary definition of the difficult second album. If Killers wasn't on it, I would have scored it even lower. Ralph right. Child's a great song, don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Killers is a thing which is giving it the extra half. Right, okay. It could very well be my lowest marked Maiden album. I'm surprised it's as low as... As that, I have to say, but there yeah. you go, five point <laughs> five out of ten. Not, not one of my favorites by yeah. any stretch of imagination. Fair enough, enough dude. I am going to give Killers a six point five. Oh, so um, Ooh, a whole one, a whole one more. mark more. Uh, I share the same thoughts as many of the same thoughts, and we as haven't as you. talked about this thing. We, we haven't, really talked, haven't about talked about it. So I listened to the album a lot. Um, That's what we did. We listened to it for about a week. For, for about a, a, a week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my mind, I kind of had Killers as, as a better album than I've concluded it is. The, the, the did you have it better than the first album? The more I, um, I, had on it, par. I had it on a par with. Yeah. But actually, when when I listened to it and started looking at the songwriting, and, and I just realized that there there was a lot of fill, a lot of songs that were a bit directionless, a bit repeat, yeah. repeated themselves an awful lot. Now, to you off the, the you know, yeah, the maiden stamp. What know? I would say is when this song or when this album does get it right, it really gets it right. Well, Colors is Colors is, uh, you know, what one of the all time classics. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it it's, is. A it's a fantastic track. It's a great song. And, and, and Rothschild is obviously a classic. And I think Murders in the Room Morgue is brilliant because it's really fast. And because of Martin Birch's production, it captures that, you know, really kind of, what's the correct term? Kind of raucous, energetic, young, hungry maiden. The, the, the production of the first album. And I didn't. Didn't. Okay. And, and I think Urs in the Room Arc and Genghis Khan, you know, with that real, real tempo, high tempo maiden. Urgency. Urgency yeah. and youthfulness. It, that's kind yeah. of captured there, Aye, um, uh, and for for those reasons, I I, I kind of um given it that extra point. Okay. Uh, I take I take so it I take maybe. I take your reasons, if, but if you, if you it's see what I'm still at. it's still there are two standout tracks and one track which is great. Indeed. Yes, yes. Now when you compare it, it falls between two stones. Yes, you've got Iron Maiden. You've got what's coming next. Yes. And what's coming next yes. is stratospherically better. I agree. Right. I agree. I agree. And I think uh, I think we can come. I'm really looking forward yeah. to the next episode. <laughs> so at 5.5 .5 and at 6.5, uh, we have then an Ed Factor score of 6. 6. Yeah. Out of 10. Then. Yeah. Which is considerably less than the debut. 7.25 isn't it yes mm -hmm. yes so the debut is better but we'd love to know what you guys think we, we, we do have a we've got a we put the twitter out there we put the vote the, the poll out there but yep let us know let us know if we you, know if that... you think i'm talking rubbish let me know <laughs> please say it. likewise uh you guys may i'm sure there'll be plenty of people out there that have this album you know as one of their favorites or whatever it's bruce's favorite so... um of the first two so yeah is... yeah uh, I, I bet that's because of production. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, fair. Yeah. I, I bet that's because it captures the power. Yeah. Of, and it's quite influential. 
Yeah. It's quite influential. It is. It is. You know, uh, and maybe we're being hard on it, but... Well, I, I am being hard on it. Mm. I'll, I'll not that because, you know, Maiden are my favourite band and always have mm. been, always will be. And there are, there are, you know, yeah, I have to have a distinction between, you know, certain albums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And certain mm -hmm. albums which maybe don't make the grade. Yeah. There are a few. No, I'm, you I'm, know, not I'm, that many, but, you know. Not that many, but, no, I'm, I'm, I stand by my, my mark off it. I think it's a good album. But I don't think it's a great album. Yeah. This yeah. at this moment it, this feels like to me D Day. Mm -hmm. We're ready to storm the beach. Yeah. In a metaphorical metal sense. As in uh maiden or things are coming. Things are coming. Yeah. Things, are, things coming. are brewing. A few aces yeah. up the sleeve coming. Yep. 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 So a certain meeting under an arc light at a certain festival is coming. Yes. Yes. And uh it's it's just it's it's going. There's going to be a resurgence. Yes, there's going to be a resurgence. <laughs> so yes, uh, many of you will know what we are uh, hinting at. So until then, until then, uh, tune in next week when we will be talking about the next album, which will be Number of the Beast. But until then, from Addy and Nico and everybody else, yep, and Andy and Chris. Catch you later. Look forward to hearing from you. Please like and subscribe. Follow us on Twitter. And thanks for all your support so far. Yep. And share the word with your mates. And keep it real, guys. Yep. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Woo-hoo.